So, wow, the Blue Beetle movie totally goes there. They killed his dad. Oh, we're going to talk about that. I thought that was too sad. I was like, not the dad. But then, then, Carapax dragged Victoria Cord into the flames to be burned alive with him. Oh, so hardcore. So hardcore. I had mixed feelings about that. I mean, F around and find out, right? Like after the flashback when we saw what she did to Carapax over all those years, we knew he was gonna kill her. But what about Jaime insisting that he wasn't a killer? Was it just for him personally that he, he, you know, he's like, I don't personally kill, but if you wanna do it, go ahead, knock yourself out. I mean, shouldn't he have stopped Carapax and been like, she belongs in jail. Uh, and I mean, and also on that note, Susan Sarandon does such a good job as a comic book villain by the end of the movie. I was a little disappointed that she wouldn't get to do the classic comic book villain trope of plotting revenge from a jail cell. I mean, when kid, kid style movies go that dark, it tends to really stick with the younger audience members in particular. So, hey, you know what? Maybe it was the right move and they didn't actually show it, but they heavily implied what happened to her. And I, I was surprised. I'm, I'm curious. How do you feel about that? That creative choice? Uh, so yes, welcome to my spoiler review for Blue Beetle, where I'm going to start out with some overall thoughts on the film. We gotta talk about Ted Cord, and then I think the best way to break down the rest of the movie is going character by character. Where are the character posters? What a missed opportunity, particularly because the posters for this film, the ones that they have had, are pretty cool. And this movie is full of so many big personalities, they definitely deserve character posters. I mean, I know that Warner Brothers has been very busy and spent almost all their money on advertising Barbie, where they had so many character posters. But I mean, did they just give up on non-gun DC movies after Shazam 2 and The Flash? I mean, especially, you would think they would have character posters, particularly because the actors can't promote the film due to the strike. I I'm, I'm really bummed about it. Uh, and even though some character posters, like Marvel has these like recent character posters that I think are a waste of everybody's time, but I even would've taken those at this point because I, I, I think they deserve character posters. All right, so on that note, Blue Beetle doesn't even really feel like a DC movie to me. And I've never really felt the Blue Beetle even fits with the Justice League, uh, although he is often a member of the junior team. Uh, I would say the problem with, the uh, with an expanded DC universe is the same one that Marvel finds itself now having. And that's that the more that you branch out, the less cohesive the world feels. And characters just, they just don't fit together, uh, particularly outside of the realm of comic books. You're just like, you're just throwing everybody together in a blender here, man. And that's what it feels like. Uh, Cause does Blue Beetle ever really need to be a DC movie? I, I don't think so. I think the character could continue to exist on his own. Although I will, some of you might be like, what the heck, Grace? Don't worry, in a moment, I'm gonna come around to a Young Justice movie as I did in my notes. And I actually have a little bit of a pitch for that. But they clearly set up a sequel that is just a Blue Beetle film. And that's with the mid credit scene where we learn that Ted Cord is alive. Yeah, no sh any comic book fan worth their salt could tell you that he was still alive as soon as they said his character was missing. I was like, all right, when and where is he going to show up and who's playing him? I th and on that note, I think it would have been stronger to have Ted Cord actually show up in the mid-credits scene instead of having someone else send Jenny Cord, Ted's daughter, a distress me message saying your father is still alive. But I guess they felt that they could get a bigger star to play Ted Cord if the movie does well, but it turns out that's an awfully big if now. Uh, and I think it would have been better to have the tease. Just get the best actor that you can. I mean, this isn't like a star-studded affair. Go for personality, go for someone who's fun. I think it would have generated more chatter. Right now, the mid-credit scene, because Ted Cord's not a huge character, really. Again, as I said in the non-spoiler review, a super deep cut. It's not even Booster Gold, who's of course very good friends with Ted Cord. And Booster Gold's getting a, a DC show, maybe. Uh, you know, apparently that's what, the, that's what they said, but who knows, they're going so slowly. But I, I, I mean, it would have been great to show Ted Cord hanging out when Booster Gold's trying to send the message and it messes up. And there he's like, Booster, you messed up my, 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 my security message. I mean, that, I mean, it just, it's not, it's too subtle of a tease for a next film, I think, to really do what an end or a mid credit scene is supposed to do. Also, this Blue Beetle is so much about Latino culture now. Even Ted Cord's daughter is Latino. And his leftover tech, by the way, is so inferior to the alien Blue Beetle suit that we now have. And also Ted Cord, he's, he's what adds the Spy Kids-esque elements to the film, his technology. So I'm not sure that bringing Ted Cord into the mix is the right idea for a sequel anyway. I think it might pull it in a direction 
like a Spy Kids Power Rangers direction, but thankfully the first movie was able to avoid. And that's why I'm like, maybe we should do Young Justice, because where's Blue Beetle gonna go from here? My choices would be bring, to be, you know, just like uh, Spider-Man are still, there's still Spider-Man movies, but they bring in another character from the MCU to make it feel like ex expansive and a little bit of a bigger story. So that's fine, let's bring in, we don't have to bring in all the Young Justice members. I would bring in, my choices, and I'm curious who yours are, would be Starfire and or Miss Martian for the alien angle, right, for the alien connection. Uh, I thought that was an, a funny joke when George Lopez says, I don't like that word, that was great. Or Aqualad, since Palmyra City is directly on the water. You know, maybe you could just do Young Justice, a small version of the team, and it would be hard for it not to seem like the Titans show. But I think that uh, director Soto could, could get it done, considering how well, good a job he did with this movie. And Blue Beetle, I think, is the hardest character in Young Justice to adapt, and it went so well. Wow, Palmyra City, they make it feel so real. Just futuristic enough to be like a comic book city, but not so futuristic that it seems ridiculously out of reach. You feel like you could maybe go there now. It was really nice. I mean, like when Jaime arrives at the airport at the beginning of the movie, that was done so well, because it felt like we were arriving in Palmyra City. And I was like, wow, what a nice place. I loved downtown Palmyra City, including the Court Industries complex. I was like, oh, let's see the cafeteria. We didn't get to really, but I loved it. You know, I like uh, corporate office complexes. And then even when Jaime and his sister are looking at downtown from their neighborhood across the bay, I thought that was really great. And also kind of gave you uh, a, 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 an idea of where, of, uh, like the, how the world was set up physically. The world building overall was excellent. And you, I mean like, Victoria Cord's swank house was great. Uh, Ted Cord's abandoned mansion, the flamingos. And then his beetle cave in the basement, nice neon blue lighting in there, to the secret island where Victoria Cord is doing her evil experiments, which was very effectively name dropped in the beginning of the movie. You're like, oh, I like it. I, oh yeah, we did, we did hear about that island. Uh, Jenny was asking questions about it. Uh, so, because often in superhero movies, locations will just be introduced as needed, and they just, it seems too easy. But here, it seemed all very organic, and you could, like, place everything. You're like, oh, okay, I can see how this is here, and you could kind of, the map started to form in your head, which was cool. It made it seem, again, more real. Although, it was very unrealistic that Victoria wouldn't rip her brother's abandoned mansion apart down to the, down to the foundation and below to the basement and find that beetle cave because Victoria knew that her brother was hiding stuff, and we saw, she, we saw later on in the film that she was willing to rip apart anything to get what she wanted, from South America, or how she got Carapax, uh, to also to finding the scarab at the beginning of the movie. The fact that she would leave Ted Cord's ab uh, mansion abandoned just made absolutely zero sense to me. Then as we've learned from Coco and other films, Latino culture has a unique, positive relationship with death, which is brought to life here with the death of Jaime's father, mid-film. Oh, Damien Alcazar plays such a kind, noble man that I felt absolutely horrible that he suffered a heart attack and did, died, you know, when they were, his, his family was trying to get away. And he was, he was even in the middle of dying trying to tell his daughter everything was going to be okay. I mean, I, I, it was devastating. And I felt it was just too cruel to do to Jaime. I was like, it's too much. But they did it to him anyway. And they did it with the idea that his father, they sold it by saying, his father had to die because then his spirit was there to keep Jaime from crossing over to the other side when Victoria Cord tries to kill him in the third act. It's like, it's not your time yet, Jaime, go back. And his father was able to do that for him. So yes, the Coco and Encanto-esque imagery was beautiful. When they turned the corner and there are all those candles, that sea of candles, I was like, no, it's beautiful, but no, come back. Uh, but I didn't think that Jaime should have had to lose his dad. It was so sad to think that if the scarab had never attached itself to Jaime, his father wouldn't die. It was very sad. I mean, I get that the movie tries to highlight the hardships of the Latino community that can seem never ending and unfair, and that the Latino community prides itself on turning that pain into power, which was a great line in the movie. But losing his dad was too much. I really did not care for it. And he reminded me of the dad on Ugly Betty as well. Another great Latino dad. Oh, it was sad. Okay, let's talk characters. And I don't have any fancy character posters to use. Thanks a lot, Warner Brothers. So again, I'll just have to make do. Hands down, the best character in the movie by far and away is Sholo Maraduena as Jaime Reyes, AKA Blue Beetle. As I said in my non-spoiler review, he is a perfect leading man. Funny, charming, earnest, and he can sell the action sequences. And also while he comes from TV, Cobra Kai, 
he feels very cinematic here. Sometimes an actor will pull a project down. You're like, oh, I feel like I'm watching Cobra Kai. Nope, always felt like I was watching a movie star in a movie. Now about his suit, some people have really liked the practical aspects of it. And he does look great in it in some shots. But as I said in my non-spoiler review, it's clearly a rubber suit. You know, they try and sell it with all this nanotech, again, like Iron Man, but then you're like, oh, it's just a rubber suit, man. So when he turns out, for instance, to be bulletproof or doing all this fancy stuff, you're like, I, I mean, I just couldn't buy it. You know, they're like, oh, look at him fly around. I'm like, in a rubber suit? And they're like, yes. And he's, so, so I mean, and also, oh, by the way, the face, the face on the suit, I know it's very much like the comics, but it's also too cute for me. It's too cutesy, too kitty. I did appreciate, though, how powerful the suit could get. And when it crackles with blue energy is by far and away when it's, it's coolest. And I do love blue electric color. I've been, always been a fan of that. However, it continues to bother me, just as it does in the comics and the animation, that the suit can do anything. And here in the spoiler review, I can talk a little bit about what the suit can do. But again, it can do anything. You, you just say it and the suit will do it. It can create any object, seemingly create steel blades. I'm like, why are we creating uh, elements? Huge staples to pin down opponents that then dissolve. They don't even get absorbed back into the suit. I'm like, I mean, maybe they dissolve into like particles that we don't see go back into the suit. But I'm like, what's happening? It's just too much. And because there's no rhyme or reason to it, you can't really play along and think about what you would do if you were in the suit, which I think is crucial to, you know, really uh, um, connecting with comic book superhero characters. In fact, a lot of times, Jaime just tells the suit to take over, and he goes, jo just goes along for the ride. And I don't think that narratively, that's very compelling. A good example of my problem with this whole thing, the suit setup, is that at one point, Jaime is going up against Carapax, and I was like, Carapax has decades of guerrilla warfare experience. How is Jaime, who I don't even think plays sports at school, going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this guy? And the answer is, he just lets the suit take over. And again, that's just a letdown. I mean, in the end, Jaime seems to be able to win by getting real mad, his passion powering his suit. What does power his suit, by the way? His suit seems to have a never-ending supply of energy. At one point, it has to reboot. And I'm like, what are you rebooting from? You're not connected to a power source. You know, like, where are you getting, like, when he creates, the suit can create anything. I'm like, where is that material coming from? You've made a long blade. Where do the nanoparticles from that come from? It just, it makes no sense to me. It, it takes me out of it. It drives me crazy. Uh, but, you know, so while Jaime has a lot of love, which, you know, flies in the face of what Carapax says. Carapax is like, your love for your family is your greatest weakness. And Jaime's like, no, it's my greatest strength. And I'm like, how? I mean, I get that it, it may be like motivationally to keep you going, but are you saying that powers the suit? They never explained. So, but Jaime has no strategy and he never gets any strategy even by the end of the film. But his grandma has strategy. You know, at points I thought that her revolutionary past was a little bit too silly, but sometimes it really worked. For instance, my favorite was when they were deciding how to storm Victoria Cord's compound. And his grandma was like, oh yeah, I've done this before. We should take that tunnel and go, get, go to the power source. It was great. I was like, oh, that worked. But then they made it cheesy again. Uh, speaking of family, I feel George Lopez brings a lot to this movie, actually. Sort of like Jaime's Alfred, in a way. Or actually, Lucius Fox. Allow me to explain. It was a really good idea to make his conspiracy theories and his tech tinkering actually helpful. So that he kind of becomes Blue Beetle's secret weapon. You know, like he was able to, you know, come up with... Uh, stuff that even Jenny Cord couldn't. And because it was such crazy tech that was off the grid, it was hard for the more established Cord uh, industries to take it on. I like that. I thought that was a good idea. And so at the end of the movie, uh, George Lopez's Rudy, I feel is positioned to be the Lucius Fox of Cord Industries. I mean, Jenny Cord just gives him a new truck, but I was like, I think she should offer him a job, quite frankly, so that he could work there coming up with exciting out of the box ideas for the company, but then also moonlighting as part of Blue Beetle's team. So I was like, ah, I see a clear path forward there, but his dad is dead, it's so sad. Why can't he have his dad too? All right, I'm not sure if in real life, by the way, Jenny Cord would get to take over Cord Industries after Victoria's death. I mean, the company is way too big not to have shareholders, and Jenny seems to have no business experience on paper or in real life. I'm like, it's really hard to be a CEO. I'm not saying that she can't, like, you know, lead the company as a visionary. I mean, maybe we have to see who the chief financial officer is, right? But I don't know. 
But Bruno Marquezine makes it believable enough. Like for a moment, I was like, I don't think that would happen. But I was like, ah, whatever. And she has really nice chemistry with Maraduena, which is rumored to be real life chemistry. A lot of times romantic interest roles can fade into the background or they can become too competitive with who's supposed to be the lead of the movie. But here, uh, Marquezine uh, as Jenny Lord gets the balance just right. She's almost, speaking of Iron Man, a little bit like Gwyneth Paltrow's Pepper Potts. I I thought she was great. Susan Sarandon ends up being really great, though, as Victoria Cord. Her opening sequence, getting off that helicopter, I thought her dial. I mean, I couldn't tell if it was the dialogue, it's like, and there was no one who could deliver it well, or if Susan Sarandon wasn't helping with her awful line readings. Although her outfit was fantastic. I was like, nice boots and coat, Victoria. But by the end of the movie, she seems to really be having a good time. You know, recently in that Netflix movie, The Adam Project, Katherine Keener was the female villain, corporate villain, but she just seemed like a big enough name actress collecting a paycheck, you know? Like, she wasn't really into it. She was just like, yeah, 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 here's my monologue. I'm going to monologue and then get out of here. But instead, Sarandon goes for it and is in a significant amount of the film, which is also cool. You know, like Katherine Keener just showed up a little bit. But Susan Sarandon is very much the villain of the film. And I love the look on her face, by the way, when she realizes that Carapax remembers everything that she did to him over the years. And it, it, they had a borderline flirtatious relationship. And then when you learn that she knew Carapax since she was a child, made it even weirder and creepier. Uh, but that she, he's going to take her out with him. And that was I thought that was a great moment. Uh, again, I told you this movie is dark as Carapax decides to reunite with the ghost of his dead mother who was killed by a cord industry bomb, which is right out of uh, the MCU Stark industry situation with those bomb, that bomb killing uh, Wanda and Pietro's parents. Uh, but that was also very sad, Carapax's mother. I was like, this is so sad. Uh, Raul Max Trujillo as uh, Carapax, he's okay. But I guess the movie already has a lot of big personalities, and I don't know if you would be, I mean, I think he might add actually, even though he's kind of muted, he might actually add balance to the film, you know, when you think about it. But I would say my biggest problem with Carapax was that his OMAC suit looked a bit cartoonish and silly. That's right, OMAC, also from DC Comics. Nothing to do with Batman or Checkmate here. Uh, and the idea of the tech didn't totally work for me. I was like, how does this, also, again, I was like, how does this work? But he got the general idea, and I was I'm, I don't think OMAC was big enough in the comics for me to feel, oh no, you wasted it, like with, with the MCU and this recent Secret Invasion series. I was like, that's fine, this is an okay use of OMAC, whatever, and I appreciated the nod to the comics. And Harvey Gillen, who I'm a big fan of lately, does a nice job with a very small role, as I said in my non-spoiler review, but here I can go into a little bit of detail. Uh, now, because I, because you know, he had a particularly good moment. My audience really cheered for the, and, you know, press uh, press screenings don't seem don't usually have as big a reaction as like fan screenings, or audience general audience screenings. But even here, my press audience was like, that was great, and it was great <clears throat> because they had the ongoing gag where Susan Sarandon kept calling him Sanchez, and that wasn't his name. So when he finally stands up for himself at the end of the movie and says his full name and like and you know helps Blue Beetle, my audience loved it and it was great. Although I felt bad for him too. I was like, "You come through the tor- door too, buddy," because he got killed like with a big blood spurt, which also surprised me. Uh, and then when Ted Cord's, you know, speaking of surprising violence in the film, Ted Cord's silly. Beetle ship, whatever, right? When it impaled a soldier in its foot and then it couldn't get it off the foot while it was walking around, I was like, that is hardcore. But then the movie switches gears that the move that the, the ship to create cover farts blue smoke. I was like, this movie's all over the place, man, but somehow it's working, which really is a credit to the director. Finally, Belissa uh, Escobedo as Jaime's sister also was good. I liked her, particularly because of Escobedo's performance. But I do think she had a bit of a bad attitude. She caused a lot of problems for her brother. Uh, And I don't think she worked hard enough to flee when she fell down when her family was trying to escape. And then her father had to come back and get her, and that's what killed him. I was like, she's not even trying to get out of there. She's just like, oh, no, I'm down. Somebody come get me. And I felt she was a little responsible for her dad's death, which made me like her character a little bit less. I I mean, she felt guilty about it, but I was like, I really do think that... You know, you're at least partially responsible for this. Uh, By the way, speaking of uh, culpability, I thought that his family did not, you know, they didn't feel bad enough for goading him into opening the burger box that revealed the scarab that then attached to his body. I mean, they couldn't have known that was going to happen. And, you know, it it, it was going to only attach to him anyway because it, it chose him. 
But still, you know, they were, you know, they peer pressured him into opening that box, even though Jenny said not to open it. And then none of them took responsibility for that. (laughs) I was like, wow, that really did not go well. And that was your fault. Uh, I was there. I saw it happen. It's totally your guy's fault. So that's my spoiler review for Blue Beetle. What do you think of the film? What were your favorite moments and characters? And was there anything that you didn't care for? And what did you? What, what would you have done? Would you have killed off Victoria Cord? Should uh, Ted Cord return for the sequel? Or do you think Angel Manuel Soto should instead move forward with the Young Justice movie? Although we'll see how the box office is. They might end up not doing anything. All right, so share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.